Okay, I think we can start now. Um, so I will start with my introduction and you can, if you like, please use the chat box and uh, introduce yourself um, during my introduction. So welcome everyone and I hope you are all doing well regarding the circumstances. My name is Anna Holthaus and I'm the project coordinator of the MSP Institute working on gender and chemicals. The MSP Institute is a small charitable association based in Berlin, Germany, dedicated to supporting high quality dialogue and collaboration among stakeholders, stakeholder participation and good governance. And we've been working on gender and chemicals since 2017 with support from the German Federal Environment Ministry and have been active in the cycling process since then. And my colleague, Mino Hamati, is a co-founder and associate of the MSP Institute. She is advising the project and will facilitate our webinar today. So with our webinar series, 45 Minutes for Gender and Sectors, we invite you to join us once a month for 45 minutes on gender equality and its interconnections to the multi-sectoral world of chemistry. And every last Tuesday at, of the month at 2 p.m., you have the opportunity to learn from experts and um, to discuss and brainstorm together how we can create gender just and chemical safe sectors. In February, we started with gender and chemicals and toxicology. In March, we talked about gender and chemicals and cosmetics. Uh, last month, we discussed gender and chemicals and science. And today is webinar four on gender and chemicals in textiles. The sixth webinar in June will then be on gender and chemicals in agriculture. And please note that we are recording this session and we'll make it available on our gender and chemicals website and our YouTube channel. And with that, I hand you over to Mino. Thank you very much, Anna. A warm welcome uh, from my side as well to this webinar on gender and chemicals in the textile sector. Here's the agenda for today. We have a presentation by Alexandra Katerbo and Olga Speranskaya from Hay Support, and I'll introduce them in a minute. Uh, that presentation will be about 15 minutes. We'll then have time for Q&A, for questions and comments uh, from you all. And then uh, we will want to uh, use a virtual board to do a little brainstorming uh, with you about how to improve the textile sector from a gender and chemicals perspective. For our interaction and the Q&A, we'll use the chat function and you can also raise your virtual hand. Actually, depending on the version of Zoom you have, your uh, virtual hand is probably at the bottom of your Zoom window under reactions and there you can raise and then also lower your hand. If you have an older version, it is under the participant list. You open the participant list by clicking on that icon at the bottom of your Zoom window. And next to that is the chat icon that op also opens on the right-hand side of your Zoom window uh, to, to use the chat. And if you want to introduce yourself and tell us where you are, use the chat as well for that. If you have a technical problem, also use the chat. We're no experts, but we'll try and help. And if your connection isn't good, you might want to try and switch off your video. Otherwise, do keep it on. It's nice to at least see each other on the on the video, although uh, these times are so weird and we can't really meet, meet, meet. Thank you so much. So now um, let's turn to our presentation and the guest speakers uh, of today, Olga Speranskaya and Alexandra Katerbo from Hay Support. Olga and Alexandra are co-directors of Health and Environment Justice Support, in short, Hay Support. They both work on uh, chemicals policy at national, regional, and international levels, and published various uh, reports and articles on gender and on sustainable textiles. And soon, Hay Support will launch a new clearinghouse website on sustainable fashion. We are excited to hear more from them, one in Ottawa, Canada, and the other, I believe, today in Italy. Olga and Alex, we're very happy that you are able to join us today and share your thoughts and knowledge about gender and chemicals in the textile sector. You have the floor and I'm not sure who of you is going to start. Looks like Olga. Olga, you have the floor. Uh, yes, uh, so thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Minu. And um, Anna, could we, could, uh, could we have our presentation on the screen? So, um, 
Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everyone, wherever you are. So, um, yes, okay, so thank you very much. Um, yes, and the next slide, please. As, as Mino already said, Alex uh, and I are co-directors of Health and Environment Justice Support, and it is a nonprofit organization dedicated to achieving a healthy environment and environmental justice for people and communities affected by chemical pollution and related environmental degradation. So next slide, please. So um, to start our presentation, I would like to provide you with a short overview of the scale of the textile and clothing industry. And it is really huge. According to the UN Alliance for Sustainable Fashion, the global clothing and textile industry totally contributed $2.4 trillion to global manufacturing and employs about 75 million people worldwide, and most of them are women. So the supply chain of clothing and textile industry includes agriculture and manufacturing, processing, and fabric care, use, recycle, and disposal. And nearly all countries are involved in the textile and clothing industry, uh, though the actual involvement can derive from the uh, production of raw materials to textile and product design and manufacturing and shipping to numerous locations. So, um, however, all countries face the growing problem linked to unsustainable textile production, use and disposal, and that includes negative impact on the environment and human health, as well as devastating social consequences, especially for people in developing countries. So next slide, please. Um, the main global trends in the clothing industry include increasing production, reducing the quality of goods, and increasing the number of fashion cycles per year. So previously, the production cycle in the fashion industry was just four cycles per year, depending on the uh, season. But now um, in the fashion era, fast fashion era, so it grew up to 50 cycles a year. And it is estimated that the total clothing sales globally would more than triple in 2050 um, with the production of synthetic fiber like polyester increasing tremendously. So developing countries are disproportionately affected by the textile industry sector, not only because the manufacture of textiles is happening mainly in these countries, they also need to address the disposal of the growing amount of unwanted clothing. So next slide, please. Um, in fact, um, according to the fashion industry waste statistics, the amount of waste in the textile and fashion industry is growing rapidly, with about 85% of textile waste goes to landfill, where it occupies about 5% of landfill space, and uh, this amount is increasing. So, um, and then McCarthy Foundation estimates that less than 1% of used clothing is actually recycled into new garments. And the rest is either landfilled or incinerated. And overall textile and fashion industry is one of the biggest polluters on the planet, causing one fifth of the world's industrial water pollution responsible for up to 10% of the world's greenhouse gas emissions and contributes to plastic pollution, including microplastics. And uh, workers in the textile industry have a high risk to develop cancer uh, due to numerous toxic chemicals used by the sector. And next slide, please. So um, hazardous chemicals are applied at nearly all stages of textile and clothing um, manufacturing, starting uh, with raw material production all the way to waste management. Uh, just uh, for every kilogram of fabric, about uh, more than half a kilogram of various chemicals are used. And dyeing processes um, usually involve more than 1,600 different chemicals, including formaldehyde and phthalates and perfluorinated um, substances. Some of these uh, chemicals are persistent organic pollutants and endocrine disrupting chemicals. And people involved in the production of raw materials like farmers, as well as 
people working at the textile factories and waste pickers and recyclers, they face severe health consequences as a result of exposure to these hazardous chemicals. And in addition, people living near industrial uh, textile facilities uh, are also at risk of exposure and um, this exposure often results uh, in a loss of income due to uh, medical costs associated with uh, serious illnesses. And next slide, please. Uh, but the problem caused uh, by harmful chemicals used in textile in uh, clothing industry are linked to many diseases, and some of them are listed here. However, potential problems um, of the presence of toxic chemicals in finished fabrics have not been widely studied, and there is limited information available to consumers. And uh, while um, illnesses listed here are diagnosed uh, both in women and in men occupied in the textile sector, some of the illnesses are specifically uh, targeting women and impact their health, uh, including reproductive health. So um, noting that um, women workers dominate in this sector, for example, um, uh, in Cambodia, women comprises up to 90% of workers uh, employed uh, in the garments industry. It is important to understand um, the health impact of textile chemicals on women and the link between chemical exposure and associated health effects. So next slide, please. So examples of negative health consequences uh, for women uh, working in the textile and clothing sector, um, they inter alia include uh, breast cancer and spontaneous um, aborted first pregnancy and hypertensive uh, disorders during pregnancy. But women do not always associate uh, their health problems with toxic uh, chemical exposure as they are not aware about what chemicals they are exposed to. And the next slide, please. So um, how to better protect uh, women workers from toxic chemicals in the garment sector? So it is important to ensure transparency of information in the supply chain about hazardous chemicals used to make and treat clothes. And when this information becomes available, it is important to raise women's awareness about toxics they are exposed to and their potential health consequences and how women can protect themselves from exposure. So occupational health and safety should be ensured at all levels from the production of raw materials to textile manufacturing, clothing production, and waste management. And definitely investment into innovative products, uh, products and processes, of course, that include the use of toxic, toxic chemicals in the textile sector is a necessary step um, towards the protection of women's health. So now I would like to invite Alexander Ketterbaum uh, my co-director, to continue our presentation and talk more about uh, women's rights uh, violation in the textile sector and what could be done to eliminate it for good. Alex. Thank you, Olga. Thank you. Next slide, please. So, um, as Olga already said, so there are many problems in the textile sector and how can women be um, um, an actor of change or agent of change. So um, there is a clear violation of the right to know principle in the textile sector. So um, we see that the industry's workforce is largely, largely made up of low skilled women. So they work there as sewers or in, in the dyeing process. Um, there is a lack of educational awareness. So in this case, a written um, education material may be difficult if there is illiteracy. And um, so we may need to think about other awareness raising uh, tools that are being used, um, commonly used. And of course, there is a lack of transparency on chemicals in materials and in the products in the supply chain. Um, so that means that the workers, female workers, they don't know what they are um, using 
or forced to use every day, but that goes up until we as end consumers or even the waste handlers, they don't know what kind of chemicals are in, um, in the products they use. Next slide, please. And so women are also main consumers of textiles. And often it's said that we have the power to influence the market, but this is very hard because it is impossible to make informed choices as we don't know what is in there. So there is no um, mandatory declaration of ingredients and that doesn't help, of course, to make informed choices. Um, what we can see often is that brands don't know themselves what kind of chemicals are in their products they sell because um, it is so difficult also for brands sometimes not always to find out what is in the mixtures in the mixture products that the chemical industry provides to the producing companies. And this is exactly why we need more transparency inside and outside the supply chain. Next slide, please. So we checked several brands and we wanted to know what can a like average consumer know about uh, sustainability of the products they buy. So we checked labels that we found on hundreds of clothes from four brands. And we also checked um, what is available online. So you can find here <laughs> our results, but um, we checked them against the guidelines of the uh, UN Environment and ITC 2017 uh, guidelines for providing product sustainability information. So that was the first, so to say, roadmap test or application of these guidelines for a whole sector. And what we found is that most of the labels don't tell the consumer anything, so no, no good information. And there is a lot to do still for brands to at least um, meet their own promises. So often it's said, um, yeah, this, is, this and that product is sustainable or we use uh, organic cotton but in fact, if you look, if you dig deeper, you find out that there is that information is very scarce, or not. Um, you cannot find find it at all. So next slide, please. The textile and garment industry can become sustainable. So how could they do this? Um, there should be uh, new techniques to minimize water consumption, for instance. And um, of course, what is very close to our demands always is um, minimize and eliminate the use of toxic chemicals and also regrettable substitutions. So also to take actions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, um, include the use of natural fiber because um, as Olga already mentioned, polyester is one of the most used fibers. It makes up to 80% of all uh, synthetic fibers that are being used on the market. And yeah, the source of polyester is um, oil or gas. It's plastic. And um, yeah, increase the use of recycled fibers and products. However, that is a good solution, but recycled fibers are often not as stable as virgin materials and uh, this is, is not the golden solution. So the only solution here is use less. So no fast fashion, use less clothes. Um, improve packaging and try to avoid plastic packaging. Reduce overconsumption, as I said, that means improving the quality of the fabric, minimize returns, minimize waste, there are a lot of um, pilot projects out there and ideas um, which can be explored further. And also ensure the implementation of the right to know principle, which is very important because without knowing what we 
find what we have in products along the whole supply chain and we cannot change it. And the same, the same applies to knowing your supply chain. So if you as a brand don't know who is in your supply chain, you will have a hard time in the future to cope with, um, to, to cope with the demands of the consumers, but also of um, regulation in the future. And el eliminate gender violence and recognize women as agents of change. So uh, we touched upon gender violence. It's really a big problem. And this also has to change. Next slide, please. So here are a few more words about gender-based violence because it's such a huge problem in the textile sector and it is not really related to chemicals, but we didn't want to not include it because it's, it's important when we talk about women. So human rights violation remains a serious challenge in the textile sector. Um, the industry workforce is largely made up of low skilled women, as we already said. Um, mostly there is no information on toxic chemicals and textiles provided to the workers. We have difficult working conditions, lack of, uh, we have low wages, lack of health insurance, lack of safety at work. So again, this all hits maybe not the poorest of the poor, but the very poor uh, workforce in uh, low uh, income countries. Women have a fear of losing their jobs and pregnant women are often refused employment or are being uh, fired. And there are also other forms of violation of rights and freedoms, including um, like real violence, like beating and, and other things. Or even, there's even a case you will find on our website soon that um, uh, has been retrieved by Femnet of a um, uh, killed uh, textile worker. Next slide, please. So here, I won't read it out to you, but here I found um, this here, this um, source, there was a study with uh, interviews with workers and supervisors. And I think this speaks for itself. If you just want to read it through quickly. Um, we wanted to include it because it is it illustrates so well the situation. Next slide. So women as agents for change, what does this mean? It means stand up for women's rights, form unions, form women workers committees, increase awareness and education, ensure gender equality, promote women's leadership. And these are just a few points. I think we could go on and on on this and also have more ideas, but just to remind us all what we um, should fight for. And next slide, please. And we already mentioned it. So soon we are going to release our new website. It's called sustainfashion.info. And you will find a lot of information. It's, it's a clearinghouse website. You will find a lot of information about many of the topics that we already touched upon. And um, yeah, I think this is going to be a great resource for everyone to find facts and studies and stories. So I hope that this will help um, a lot of NGOs and trade unionists and workers and policymakers and brands and others in the industry to, um, to improve the whole situation around textiles, not only on chemicals, but also on human rights. Um, on women's rights and yeah so check it out it it will come up soon and there is a english version and a german version available so next slide please that that 
was it for now. Thank you for your attention. And here you have our contacts and we are very much looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Olga and Alex, and also for this uh, slide with the um, kind of antique telephone. So one could even call you on a landline, at least that's the impression. Anyway, thank you very much for this uh, presentation and the wide range of uh, topics that you included looking at the sector uh, as a whole and uh, not just on at chemicals issues. Uh, and uh, sharing quite a bit of information. So when we look at the chat, uh, people have already started asking questions. There was one about uh, PAFS uh, exposure uh, and if that's an important issue in textiles. And thank you, Delfina, for sharing the link to the study that is relevant. There's also a question around, uh, do you have references of the cancer incidents in the textile, in textile workers? Um, there's a question around uh, secondhand clothing and if that is safe or safer to use. Um, and there's a question, studies on skin irritation due to exposure to plastic clothing. Um, and another one, which chemical related UN agency is responsible for enforcing regulations for textile industries. So um, there's a few uh, questions, particularly with regard to, I think, to data and, and, and scientific background or studies that you might be able to share. Uh, and I'm wondering who would like to pick up the question first. Olga, you unmuted yourself, so you might want to go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, so uh, uh, thank you very much for the questions. They are all great. So regarding the toxic chemicals, yes. Yeah, so besides uh, PFAS, so perfluorinated chemicals in textiles, uh, there are many others, as I said, in, in the dyeing process alone, more than 1600 chemicals are used. And among them are, for example, uh, formaldehyde. Uh, formaldehyde is used to keep clothes uh, wrinkle free and um, shrink-free, and it is a known respiratory uh, irritant and carcinogen. And also uh, brominated flame retardants are used to help um, fireproof clothing and can be found even in children's clothing, which is weird. And uh, flame retardants are known to cause uh, thyroid disruption and uh, uh, learning problems and uh, delayed mental and physical development, and uh, they are known like endocrine disrupting chemicals. And also heavy metals are found in dyes and leather tanning and can cause nervous system damage and kidney damage and uh, also carcinogenic and uh, depending on the heavy metals. So uh, besides PFAS, there are uh, many others indeed. And uh, there was also a question about secondhand clothes, whether, whether it is safe or not. Um, if it is the same police there, why should it be safer than the original clothes? It is not safer for people, but it is safer for the environment because the less clothing we throw out, the less uh, waste we generate, right? Yeah, so the data that we provided in the beginning of the presentation, they are really uh, like concerning because we can recycle like only 1%. Um, of old clothing into new clothes. It means that we can downcycle, but we cannot like upcycle. Uh, and um, yeah, so wearing second hands is good for the environment, yes, but it is the same, um, it is bad for people unless the problem of toxic chemicals is resolved. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, Olga. I see that Alexander wanted to uh, uh, answer one other question about uh, the list of uh, harmful substances or harmful chemicals. You say, Alex, uh, you can't copy the list, but if you uh, if we, we PDF it, uh, we can make it available when we make the video available and your presentation, we can add it to that. And I'm assuming that we can also uh, expect your website to carry a list of references, uh, list of chemicals, but also list of, uh, of references of studies. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, we can share the link again in the, um, in the, uh, in the chat. Um, but uh, Alex, if you could send the list that you just didn't, wasn't, weren't able to copy, then we would uh, share it as a PDF together. Uh, with the with the uh, recording of the webinar. Now there's more. Uh, yeah. And Alex is also answering the question right here in the chat. 
if if uh, if you allow me, I'd like to uh, go to a question uh, that uh, uh, Desiree uh, asked here about uh, well, basically a structural change. Less consumption would also mean less production in the long run, meaning our jobs at risk. So how I what is it uh, uh, that we can do to break this kind of vicious cycle of overconsumption supporting job creation? Do you want to share any thoughts around that? Yes, I, well, there are several ideas out there at the moment. So one, of course, one thing that we need is better quality. If, if we have better quality, we can wear it longer and it lasts longer. So there are ideas, for instance, that when new technique, you can scan your body, you can get clothes tailored down especially to the size that you need. You could pick the fabric that you want or sharing um, vintage clothes or secondhand clothes. And so there are different pilot projects out there and studies out there that are looking out for ideas. What would be attractive for consumers to change their habits and switch from fast fashion to like slow fashion or quality fashion. Mm -hmm. So um, that, is, that is one thing. And the other thing is, of course, if you, um, we all know that your t-shirt only has to be like 50 cent, euro cent more expensive to, to pay a living wage for the workers in, in Bangladesh or India or China. So, mm -hmm. And we also know that consumers are very willing to share this, uh, to pay this. And so it, solutions are in the air. It, it just needs to be done. And um, Hey Support is also a member of the German Textile Alliance. So we hear a lot there about problems that different actors in the supply chain have. But for problems, we also have already solutions. So for instance, it is, it is possible to share um, what kind of chemicals are being used and to have a real good working chemical inventory in the production site. Mm. So there, there's even an app where you can scan the label. It doesn't have to be a barcode of the chemical product and it goes automatically into an inventory which can be looked at by um, the brand that is a contractor. Mm -hmm. And I also said what already said that without knowing your whole supply chain, brands cannot succeed in this. Mm -hmm. So the political will is changing. We are going to have a supply chain legislation, which of course we would like to be a bit stronger but it's a first step and the regulation will be more strict in the future and there will be more demands and companies should kind of um, be ahead of it and get, get their things in order to comply. So mm -hmm. a lot of them do, but some of them, they don't even know their supply chain. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. and, and that is really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you can't, you can't manage what you can't, mon what you don't monitor uh, or what you don't measure. Mm -hmm. Exactly. I just want exactly. to add to this. And um, I wanted to say that, for example, in Canada, um, so um, a draft strategy about the Great Lakes um, water quality was released and um, just recently. And uh, one of the concerns was that the level of PFAS, perfluorinated chemicals in the environment is quite high. And one of the um, routes of exposure uh, were consumer products, including clothes. Mm -hmm. And even though Canada, for example, bans the use of per perfluorinate, uh, certain um, perfluorinated chemicals in clothes, they are imported from other countries. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And consumers simply do not know that these chemicals are present in the, mm -hmm. in the consumer products, including in the clothes that they buy. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's a huge concern. So sharing what is in your products, what is in your clothes with consumers so that they can 
I mean, make the right choice whether to buy this one or to switch to another another one because there are alternatives and there are mm -hmm. safe alternatives to perforated chemicals, for example, right? Mm -hmm. But people need to know to make the yeah. right choice, right? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. I need to look at the clock a little bit. Uh, we have a few more minutes we would like to use to brainstorm a little bit with you. Thanks so much, uh, everybody who's been sharing links, information uh, and, and remarks in the chat. We'll copy that and make that available uh, when we uh, document this session so it, it won't be lost. Um, well, we'll, we will be saving the chat. Uh, Anna will copy a link into the chat right now. Um, that goes to um, a mural and that's a virtual board where we're inviting you, or Pia copied that, thank you Pia. <laughs> well, we're inviting you to just quickly brainstorm a little bit with us, um, hearing the, uh, uh, the problems and some of the potential solutions that Olga and Alex have been discussing and you have been discussing with them. Um, what is it that uh, you believe needs to be done um, to gender mainstream more effectively in the textile sector and more broadly uh, to make the sector more sustainable uh, in general, um, as they also had a, had a broader view in their presentation. If you go to the mural, um, you can zoom in and out by using the slider on the right hand side in the bottom of your screen. You can enter this without registering. You just enter as a visitor. You can put your name or you don't as you wish, you can uh, create a post-it note or a sticky to leave a comment just by double clicking where you want it. Um, and you know, if it looks a little chaotic, we can clean it up a little later. So don't be, uh, that's, that's not a problem. Um, but I'd like to invite you uh, to go to the uh, little board on webinar four, gender and chemicals and textiles. And uh, if you have thoughts, questions, suggestions on how to improve the sector, how to improve gender mainstreaming in the sector, I invite you to leave them here on a, on a little note. You can leave your name with it or don't, uh, just, just as you wish. Um, if you don't, nobody will know who put it. Doesn't matter. Uh, if you leave your name, you're welcome to do so. And we're certainly gonna keep these things uh, to get a better idea of the thinking around these problems. If you do have suggestions what individual stakeholders should be doing, like the UN or governments, supply chain regulation, as was just discussed, or stakeholders like the industry along the supply chain, workers' unions, maybe NGOs, media. Uh, if you have suggestions on, on what these different stakeholders could do, please don't hold back uh, and, and leave notes as you see fit. I hope you can all access it and not have a problem. If you do have a problem, let us know. So there's a snail, a spider and a giraffe already on the board. You get assigned a random animal if you enter this. And uh, I invite you to leave your thoughts or questions. Okay, there's some sharing going on. Women for Women in the Textile Sector, a campaign. Uh, ensure transparency of information in the supply chain, indeed. Ensure occupational health and safety at all levels, from production of raw materials to the waste management. I need to zoom in, some of this I can't read. 
yes, uh, the fashion industry campaigns and brands could focus more on fairness rather than on the fast fashion, uh, indeed. Uh, chemical and pollution footprint indicator on labels. So the question is, what does transparency include and what can a labeling system or labeling, labeling scheme include in terms of information and guide people's uh, consumption choices? Making slow fashion affordable to everyone, because that's of course an issue, that uh, more sustainable fashion is the more expensive choice. Great worker unions for women connected to green textile chemistry organizations. Clothes should have a kind of indication about chemicals in them. Yes, uh, alternatives claiming how safe they are so people can select the safer products. I've also noticed that there's a lot of brands who say, oh, this is your sustainable choice, but they don't substantiate that in any way. So you might want to order a sustainable t-shirt, but you, you're not told what makes it more sustainable. Yes, that's, that's all around the transparency that Olga and Alex have also been discussing. Indeed, thank you. More financial support to innovations, that's another important aspect to even you know, enable the innovation that is needed. Tradi traditional materials like hemp, yam, indigo, and berries to avoid toxins and make beautiful colors. Encourage secondhand markets, thank you. While we're looking at this, I, I think I'm um, looking at the clock, but uh, I, I'm gonna give uh, the last uh, uh, word or um, opportunity for a, a final comment to Olga and Alex, if you wish, when you see this, maybe you know there are things going through your minds when you see those thoughts and suggestions or demands in, maybe in terms of your future work and uh, what you're going to be doing. Alex. So, yes, there's a lot to do. <laughs> Sector is huge, problems are huge, but we are on our way. And um, industry is also partly on their way. Politics is partly on their way. So um, I especially like the Women for Women campaign. That, that sounds awesome. Thanks for the idea. And yes, and we hope that you, you have the time soon to visit our website and get more information there. And from my side, thank you very much. It was really interesting to discuss with you and we are happy that we could be part of this session. But Olga, hand over to you. Yeah, so thank you. Uh, I'm also um, like excited uh, reading all these uh, great suggestions. Uh, for example, I love that more financial support to innovation, more focus on traditional materials. And uh, this is really, really cool. And on our website, uh, there will be a specific section on new materials that we are not like focused on polyester all the time. And they are really innovative and truly safe materials that uh, should be promoted much more and the industry should invest much more in a toxic free and safe and cool design that we can all just that we all can enjoy yeah so thank you so much and it was really exciting for us and interesting to participate in this webinar and all your questions uh, very good questions and i hope that we managed to answer at least some of them and so thank you very much uh, minu and anna for organizing that that was really awesome thank you so much Thank you. Thank you, Olga. Thank you, Alex. Thanks very much for sharing uh, knowledge and engaging in the discussion and sharing even more in the chat. We'll try and pull this all together uh, and share this with you to uh, put it on the website along with the recording and, of course, the link to the uh, website soon to come. Back to Anna. Yeah. Um... Thank you all for joining us today. And uh, thank you again to our guest speakers, Alex and Olga. Um, if you have further questions, please check our website, genderandchemicals.org, or contact us individually. And on our website, you will also find the recordings of this webinar and all webinars before. And um, also the registration link for our next webinar, um, which will be on the 29th of June. 
um, on gender and chemicals in agriculture, and you are all invited. We are very much looking forward to seeing you there. And now I wish you a nice morning, afternoon, and evening. Mm, goodbye and stay healthy. Thank you. Thank you.